Your psychic powers have been expanding rapidly since you were given that Aeon Crystal. It's imperative I test its limits, for your own sake. Oh, well, that was fun. Hey, quit messing around and help me take these guys out. You've never seen a griffin before because they stay up here in the jewel room, guarding the castle treasure. They make perfect guards because griffins love anything shiny. Say, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I thought I told you this ain't your turf no more! Did I not make myself clear? Ah! Holy shit! We have to tell the cops you were driving, Gloria, because I had a gallon of that rum raisin ice cream. Yeah, so anyway, I just got all my credits for high school. Yep, getting ready to graduate, moving up, accomplishing stuff. In fact, I'm actually going to prom with Eileen, and I was wondering if I could borrow your car? All I wanted to do was make a living vegetable. Wait, I know how to do that. Garrett says not to lick stuff I find on the ground, but this is for a good cause. A bookie, a bookie. I got something important to tell you. Really, really, really important. Um, I forgot. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Mr. Kyle McCarley. Hi, how's it going? Going good. Um, it's, it's an honor to have you. You know, uh, I don't know if you've seen who we've had on the show, but like, you know, we have all generations of voice actors and i love talking to the you know the, the the old guys like the steve blums and the 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 middle ones like the i guess Kristen freemans and then you know you're the new generation the yeah, up and yeah coming. i kind of am <laughs> <laughs> well compared to some of those other ones yeah sure sure but uh you know new generation does not mean you haven't done tons of stuff so there's plenty of stuff for us to talk about and uh plenty of stories that i know we're we're going to be getting because uh that's why I love talking to voice actors. <laughs> so uh, I guess the first thing I just want to just want to ask because it, it's a nice way to lead in. But what got you into wanting to do voice acting in particular? Um, I uh, growing up, all I ever wanted to do was be an actor. Um, I I was doing theater and stuff. I mean, when I was little, you know, I I also wanted to be like a fireman and an astronaut or whatever. But you know, as I grew older, uh, the the other stuff fell by the wayside and an actor always stayed on the list um and did all kinds of theater all through middle school and high school and everything and then uh moved out to los angeles to study theater at the university of southern california and Somewhere along the line in those four years kind of lost my passion for being on stage and, and being in front of a camera. Uh, but also while I was going to school, I got really big into World of Warcraft. <laughs> and uh, m some some friends of mine and I from, from high school found a fan site that is is long defunct now but it was called wow radio wcradio.com wow i haven't heard of that in a long time oh you you've heard of it okay yeah, yeah. um yeah it uh it now it's like a, a legal firm website or something yeah, for some reason <laughs> but anyway um so we we found this website and and one of my buddies was like Hey, they're looking for new show hosts. We should we should host a show. And I was like, we've been playing WoW for a week at this point. We we don't know enough about this game to host a podcast about it. But uh, but we were all theater nerds, and I went, you know, what we could do is we could do a radio play. So I co-wrote and co-directed and and played like twelve different characters or something. In a in a radio play, loosely based, very loosely based within the Warcraft universe, called the Chalice of Silvermoon, and uh, and and it's probably about a year after I'd graduated from college and was floundering around, not sure what I was doing with my life. I thought back on that and went, you know, that radio play was a lot of fun. Maybe I should. Uh, I don't I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Maybe I should look into a voiceover class and and see what that's all like and i did and and i fell in love nice yeah i can definitely relate to the radio plays because uh, i've done 
on this show quite a few like Star Wars ones that I've written because I grew up on like the NPR yeah. Star Wars shows and it's like radio in some ways is my favorite way to listen to consume media like it, yeah if done really well it's really captivating yeah yeah it was that was a lot of fun uh, sometimes I look back on that and go man maybe I no I don't have the time <laughs> <laughs> Well, sometimes, you know, you talk about how you play 12 characters, and sometimes, you know, even in animation, you can play, you know, talk to yourself multiple times. Like, I think, uh, what was it? There's a recent episode of Justice League Action where Mark Hamill plays both villains, the hero and himself. Yeah. As they kidnap him. I'm like, <laughs> if you want to do it, you, you can. Really cheap to record that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot less common these days in animation, uh, especially because the trend lately seems to be um, more natural sounding voices, less cartoony characters. But it does happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one thing I've, I've noticed, you know, when it comes to um, voiceover, you've done a lot of anime. And yeah. usually when I think of people doing anime, they all live in Texas because that's where Funimation is. Um, right. And, you know, Christopher Sabat and that whole whole side of things. But you're in L.A., aren't you? Yes, I am. So what is the L.A. anime scene like? Because I think the only people I know who do anime that are from L.A. are like Damian Clark and Richard Epcar, I think. Well, there's others, but those are the ones I've had on the show. So how do? You, so what's the anime scene in L.A. like? And it looks like you've done most of your anime via the Netflix craze. Uh, it's yeah. Net Netflix has gone nuts with their content, which is is great for an actor like me. Um, but uh, it's it's mostly through um the the big powerhouse studio here is Bang Zoom Entertainment. Um, they they do a lot of anime, and uh, and then there are, there are some others that that get a little bit of anime here and there. Um, I work at SDI down in uh. Down in down in Culver City a lot. Um, there's a studio called VSI that does some localization. Uh, most of the stuff that those two do is live action dubs, but they they do occasionally get anime as well. Um, and it usually does end up on Netflix. Uh, and then uh, Studiopolis is another big one here, and. Um, dubbing brothers. There's a lot of different studios that that do dubs, um, and sometimes it's anime, and sometimes it's it's live action films from France or Spain or wherever. Um, but it happens, and 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 there's a there's a good group of us here in LA that uh, that that get a lot of work from those those studios. But we all tend to work on everything it seems like there's yeah. <laughs> there's kind of a a little pool of people that that get pulled in on almost every project or or, or close to it or something well I mean, with anime you have to have the skill to be able to you know you have to you have to be able to talk a certain speed to match what they're doing you have to be able to you know, move your mouth a certain way sometimes you have to be, you have to have that skill to be able to dub or else you can't just do any voice actor you have to have the skill it's, to dub Tony Oliver is a is a director as well as an actor uh, here in L.A. works at Bang Zoom a lot, and he he kind of uh, classifies it as learning to uh, pat your head and rub your stomach at the same time, uh, because it's a very technical skill learning that that the timing behind dubbing, behind matching the the lip flaps, the the mouth movements, um, but once you get it, it it just kind of happens. I feel like. It's it's a little awkward at first, but once once you get it, you just you just roll with it, and you you learn to trust that the engineer can can fix when you're not perfect. Because I'm never perfect, and uh, and thankfully I have worked with a lot of good great engineers that have been able to work around my imperfections. So, wh how long did it take you to get the at least the, the basic skills of anime down from the very first time you were presented with it? Were you aware of what was required, or did you get on there and realize this is a lot different than you thought from doing previous voiceover work? Um, yeah, I'd done I'd done a lot of other voiceover stuff before my first anime gig, but uh, and and I'd done a little bit of video game stuff to picture, but there were no mouth movements to match. Like either the character the characters wore helmets or just their mouths didn't move because it was early video game stuff or early-ish video game stuff. 
Um, so I didn't have to worry quite so much about timing on that stuff. So, but I knew, you know, I knew how anime worked when I got into the booth. Um, and I, I picked it up pretty quickly. I, I know, I know it was a little bit like, I was a little nervous about trying to make everything fit. And I think I spoke a little bit too quickly, um, at, at the very beginning of that first session or something. But, uh, but I picked it up pretty, pretty fast and, and kind of got the hang of it. Uh, Tony was actually the director on that session, and I remember we finished pretty early, and he went, yeah, we, we blocked out a lot of time because we're, we're never sure with, with new people how quickly they're going to pick up on it, so <laughs> worked out. And did you meet your wife doing anime as well, or did you guys just happen to cross over on lots of uh, projects? No, no, we, we, uh, we met elsewhere. I got her into doing voiceover <laughs> and, and, and anime stuff because uh, we I – mean, let's, let's see, we met – uh, just before I booked my first anime gig. So, nice. yeah, so it, it kind of coincided. Like it was, we were our our relationship was very fresh when when I went in for that first that very first session on uh, on a lull in the sea. Nice, that's awesome, and it yeah. helps that you both do you know. Uh, do, do voiceover so that you know there's things that you can't share but if you're working on similar projects at least you have someone you can talk to for that who knows how long before you yeah yeah we we talk to people that are close to us we we break those ndas all the time we just make sure that nobody knows we break them <laughs> yeah well like, like me i work i've worked in like you know, i i do counseling you know with mental health and so on i've worked in mental hospitals my wife worked with a uh, 911 dispatch and so like we could share stories with each other that we can never share with anyone else yeah, because we we know how you know HIPAA works. It's like uh, we need, you at least need someone to talk to, and that really helps, especially in a field where you, you might, might yeah. not be able to talk for a year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one listener w wants to know, um, when it you so you mentioned how you you know you got you wanted to do voice acting, so on from like World of Warcraft and getting involved in that stuff. How familiar were you with anime before you got into it, as far as like the content, and were you ever shocked with what your voice is? putting on screen because you've been voicing stuff like berserk which is not most fan family friendly anime <laughs> um i uh so when i was when i was in middle school i i was watching and this this kind of gives you an idea of my age but uh i, I was watching toonami when it was an after school block Amen uh back that. then and i yeah and i was a I was a big fan of Gundam Wing in particular. I, I know I, you know, I got into Dragon Ball Z and that was fun and everything, but Gundam Wing was my was my favorite anime. Um, so I, I kind of had, I mean, I, I wasn't a big anime fan um, aside from that, but I, you know, I had some idea of what anime was and the fact that it that there was a lot of stuff that. There were a lot of there's a lot of variety in the genres within anime, um, and I and and I I had roommates that were that were fairly big anime fans, so that that helped me with some familiarity as well. Um, in terms of shows like Berserk or uh, uh, let's see, The Testament of the, of the Devil New Sister, did I get that title right? I always uh, uh, rearrange. Testament of the Sister New Devil. So you ah, that see, I knew, I knew it. There's, the, <laughs> I always rearrange the words. Um, yeah, there's, there's some projects that I know other actors are like, yeah, I'm not doing that, or, uh, um, or, or they'll be like, yeah, I'll do it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna change my name and <laughs> work, work under the cloak of anonymity, um, and I'm just kind of like, you know, if it. Uh, if it serves a, a good story, I, I don't mind if there's gratuitous sex and gore, but uh, if it's just sex for the sake of sex, I'm not as interested in that. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And, and, uh, yeah, and I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not major parts in either of the, those particular projects. Maybe I would feel differently if I were, uh, if I were playing other characters in it. I don't know. <laughs> and Berserk is one that actually I first got familiar with the original run of Berserk, I believe, on was it the Toonami Reactor when they first tried to do online streaming of Toonami. It did not work very uh -huh. well with uh, dial-up modems, but <laughs> but they tried. <laughs> um, but you know, you mentioned how you're a fan of Gundam Wing, which is my favorite Gundam show. But you you've gotten involved in 
not just one, but two Mobile Suit Gundam shows um, with Sunrise and so on. That must have been really yes, exciting to go from Gundam Wing to be like, yeah, I mean, I'm part of this universe now. Yeah, I I got to I'm I'm the voice of Mikazuki August in Mobile Suit Gundam Iron Blooded Orphans, and uh, I remember when when the auditions came around for that one, uh, I had yet to book any lead characters. Um, I I booked some some supporting roles like I'd been I was Aoba in Durarara, I was Shinji in Fate Stay Night Unlimited Blade Works. Um, and I was, I think I was working on Watchery in Your Lie in April at the time when the auditions came out, but I'd, I'd never booked, you know, the, the main character in anything. And the auditions came around and I went, oh, man, I just, I, I would love to be in a Gundam show. I, that would, that would be awesome because, because Gundam Wing, like I said, was my favorite, favorite anime. And so I was just like, I just, I just want to be in it. I don't, I don't care if I'm, if I'm just, you know, soldier number seven and hey, you stop that, <laughs> you know, and that's it. I just want to be able to say that I'm in a Gundam series. And, uh, and then, and then, uh, Mami Okada cast me as, uh, as Mikazuki. And I, I think the, the noise that I, that I made in response when I got that casting notice was, <laughs> <laughs> because I was I was very very excited. I now I now I am a Gundam pilot, which is which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, now you get to have you know be part of all those awesome artwork that they have with Gundams because each one is so unique and so you know, yeah done. And now, do you have a model of yours? Oh yeah, I have I have a collection of uh, seven of them. I think one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I've I've got four that are constructed. I've got two still in boxes, one that's half constructed. Oh, and I just got the collector's edition from season one. Wow. So that's another one. <laughs> wow. And Iron Blooded Orphans has a, you know, it, it, there's an awesome cast in that show. Um, you know that, you know, a lot of yeah. people know, like, I believe, um, I want to call him Legion. He's not Legion. Uh, well, he is Legion. But, you know, Johnny Young Bosch is in there. Yes. You have, uh, who's, you know, now an anime great, from Power Rangers to anime great, which is just yep. <laughs> kind of uh, entertaining. You know, Jameson Price, I believe, is in there. Um, there's a lot of great guys in there. That, you know, that That's a, that's a very impressive show. I haven't seen all of it yet because I just, I, I'm a master's student and I just finished my capstone, so, like, my brain has been elsewhere. Sure. But it's when I, uh, DC <laughs> Douglas, he's the one I was missing. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, there's a lot of great, awesome people in there. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, from what I've seen so far, it is it's really good. It is. It it kind of I I feel like it harkens back a little bit to the to the Gundam Wing. It's it's not Gundam Wing obviously, but there there's a lot of similarities between the two shows, which obviously excites me. Yeah. And the the other part is when someone tries to have you explain the which timeline is in because you know they <laughs> Gundam Wing its, its own timeline. It's, the main it's in its own. Line. It's yeah. in its own timeline. It's it's a standalone. <laughs> Weren't you also in Mobile Suit Gundam: The Origin? Origin? Just a no. I was. I was a. It was a cameo in in Gundam: The Origin. It's. A, it was a character that uh, Stephanie Shea is the the director on that project, and she she sent out a uh, casting notice for for a few characters that she knew were obviously major characters in the main timeline of of the show, but she wasn't sure because they were they were basically doing it as a simul dub, um, where you know they're dubbing it as each episode comes out or, or OVA comes out. So she wasn't sure how big of a role some of those characters were going to be. And when I got in for the recording session, she was like, right now you're only in this for basically two scenes, but this character's pretty important in the, in the main timeline. So if we end up going further into it, you could be coming back. We'll see. So... That that was my experience on the origin. Well, and then you're also part of you know a giant fan favorite series like One Punch Man, which has really blown up here. Um, people just love it, and you know Seven Deadly Sins is another very big one that people you know have, have really yeah, seven, embraced. Seven Deadly Sins has been surprising. One One Punch, I'm I'm incidental characters, very 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 little involvement in that, but. Uh, but Seven Deadly Sins is the one that, that surprises me. Every time I go to a convention, um, I get people 
coming through my line and, and having me sign stuff for for that. And I go, wow, I, I'm I'm amazed because it's, I'm I'm in that show for three episodes or something. Um, I'm I'm kind of a little mini mini villain, mini boss for for King to fight, and and then and then I'm gone. But uh, but that show really speaks to a lot of people, I guess, which is pretty cool. And then, you know, just to switch to another side of interactive, which you said how when you did video games, the dubbing is different because, you know, people wear helmets and yeah. it's a very different different game and that not all the time the animation's locked and so on. But you've done stuff in Nier um, Automata, which caught people off guard with how, how good and popular it was, um, a sequel to a game that wasn't as so good. good. And then so know, good. Final Fantasy XV you were part of, which is another one that really redeemed a franchise that needed it um, by now. Fire Emblem Heroes, Echoes, Disgaea 5. You've been part of a lot of really big uh, games in this past year, which have, well, this past year was a really awesome year in video games. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's been pretty cool. Um, Nier is probably my, my crowning achievement to date. I, I was the voice of 9S in Nier Automata, and, uh, but I was also Alm in, in Fire Emblem Echoes, uh, so I had two big lead characters in in the span of uh one year which which was pretty pretty great for me um and uh and and i'm i'm excited about it it's 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 yeah i, I don't know what else to say about it right now <laughs> so what was your reaction because we because near i remember the original one yeah and it wasn't it, 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 it wasn't very big but it wasn't you know a flop you know it, it, it deserved a sequel but near automata like ex exploded like it, it was not expected yeah. to sell anywhere near as many copies as it did i think it was expected to sell like half a million it sold it sold like two million three million already i think i think the last number i saw was two and a half and so maybe. like your reaction must have been just like yeah that's me that's me and like <laughs> yeah um i uh yeah when i went into the I, I had never heard of the the first near when i went in for recording and uh our the the representative from the representative from the localization team uh, John Ricciardi from from 84 was was there for almost every single one of my sessions um, recording that and and for the first session he was he was like so the first game uh, people the people who liked it really really liked it because of the story and everything but the but the game itself wasn't all that great um, the gameplay just wasn't wasn't up to par really but uh, but this game we they've got they got Platinum Games to develop the, the the game engine, so we're expecting this one to be a little bigger. And so, so he had he was probably the only one who had an inkling of how big it was going to get. But even you know just that little speech that he gave us when we walked in, I was like, uh, okay, I don't know what that means, but cool. And it, um, it even crushed yeah. like the series it was because like Nier is a spinoff of Dragon Guard. And it crushed yeah. even Dragon Card, which is a disaster. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it 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 became a, a pretty big phenomenon, and uh, and it's it's exciting. It's and and it, and I think it's I think it's deserved. I mean, I, I don't want to. I'm not trying to pat my own back. I'm I'm. It's it's mainly Yoko Taro's back and and Platinum Games. They 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 made something truly special with that game. Um, the story is is phenomenal, and I'm. I'm excited to to have been even a small part of it, let alone such a big part. Um, I, I I think the 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 story that that Nine S goes through the the that whole arc is just a gut punch, and it was a lot of fun to get to play. I'm assuming did you get to watch the Game Awards uh, last week? And this near one you got know, nominated for quite a few and won Best Music and Score, and had a lot of a uh, lot of focus there. I did not watch the Game Awards. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of award shows, but uh, but I, you know, I, I did get you know people tweeting at me. Hey, congratulations! The game won best music and score. I'm like, I, I didn't have anything to do with that part of the game, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take credit for all of it. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but you know, it got nominated for you know best narrative and best role playing game, which is you know in a year where they had competition like Final Fantasy 15 and so on, and Legend yeah. of Zelda, and it's, yeah, it was a really good year and it held its own, which yeah was awesome. Yeah, I remember when when the uh, when the categories got announced, I was like, "Best RPG," I guess if you want to call it that. Okay, sure, why not? <laughs> it's more of an action game, but yeah, I guess. 
I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to classify that one. There's a lot of different genres melded into one. Um, but the but the the response has been great. There have been a lot of other award uh, groups or award shows or whatever magazines, publications that are that are saying it's game of the year or or something else, and that's exciting. It's really exciting. It it must be a uh, you know a, a great change to go you know have a lead in that one versus like I think in God Eater two you're like one of many voices they could choose. Or yeah. other games like Final Fantasy 15, your additional voices, so that could be, if I recall, right. you can be up to four characters in a session or something like that. That one, Final Fantasy, I I voiced, I think, I don't know, ten or twelve or fifteen characters in the span of two hours or something like that. But they they all had three lines or less or something okay. as as per as per union rules. Yeah. <laughs> And now there's new union rules, so hopefully that gets you uh, more money in the future. From well, we'll see. <laughs> it's at least a step in the right direction. Since it the is. 90s. It's yes. It's a step. Yeah. <laughs> um. So uh, just switching gears a little bit. Um. You do a lot of audiobooks. I do. Which is. I do. Uh, a skill that not a lot of people have because you know I, I've listened. I, I listen to audiobooks all the time. I, I walk a lot, so I listen to audiobooks. And I'm going through, I think, Wheel of Time. So if I hated the narrator, that's 200 hours of my life I'd be gone. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and you, you, you read like the Modet, uh, the Modeset books and so on. So is audiobooks something that you wanted to get into right away and you did, or is it something that you had to be encouraged to get into? Because it's a very different skill, a very different thing to do, and it's it's yeah it's it's not for everybody um i audiobooks are are a big part of what i do still i don't know if they're if they're going to be a big part of what i do five years from now or or however long it is um because i'm you know i'm still trying to trying to make my way into the 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 big ticket studios for video games and animation but uh but in the meantime, the audiobooks are paying the bills, and uh, and they're qualifying me for for union healthcare, which is nice. <laughs> um, but uh, they can be a whole lot of fun. They are always a whole lot of work. Um, I have a I have a panel on on what do I call it? It's a life in a padded cell, or how I learned to stop worrying and love the audiobook. Uh, that I do at some of the conventions I go to, and it's it's basically kind of going through the differences between a recording session uh, for anime or video games and uh, a session for r recording an audiobook, which is almost always in this day and age and has always been for me out of my home studio, which I'm currently sitting in. Um, and and it's just it's it's a, it's a lonely existence. It's a lot of uh, it's a lot of reading out loud to nobody else in the room, getting no feedback from anybody. You send it off, and they come back to you with, "Hey, you missed this word, or you mispronounced something. Fix that." And that's it. There's not a whole lot. Of, it's a whole lot of <clears throat> excuse me. Ha. Huh. Flim. Sorry. Um, a whole lot of uh, self direction and. And uh, and 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 kind of being your own master, which is freeing in a lot of ways, but but you're also you're also a slave to deadlines, and and it uh, it makes you it makes you feel like oh hey I'm at home and I'm not doing anything else I I should be working right now, um, but it's 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 something you know and it's and it it, it beats waiting tables. Indeed, it does. And <laughs> yeah. You know, you've you've voiced actually uh, books and stories from people we've had on the show, like you know Martha Wells. He did City of Bones. Um, oh, really? Um, David Farland. We've had him on quite a bit. Um, yeah. You know, Nightingale. Yeah. And you know, uh, you know, I've I've read the L.A. Modisset Jr. books. Um, uh huh. Most of the he has a lot of books. Like, I've read a lot of his books. Yeah, yeah. I've I've I narrated uh, two series of his, and there that's not even scratching the surface on on Modisset's collection, so. <laughs> so when it comes to the, because I know uh, talking to the people who do voice work, it, the pay can be very different. Some of it you're paid up front, some of it you're paid yeah. based on sales. 
Um, when um, you do it, do you tend to do the more upfront, or do you tend to do like the sales, or is it a mix of everything? Um, so, the, so the audiobook world is is what you're talking about yeah. here, yeah, yeah. and yeah, there's there's uh there's kind of, it's kind of a new um new era because of uh because of a website called ACX that that Audible created, the Audiobook Creation Exchange, um, that has kind of opened the door to a lot of uh, self-published authors who want to get their books made into audiobooks but don't have the, the funding to go to a big studio to produce it and um, and they can they can find somebody who will produce it for them out of their home studio somebody like me uh, on ACX and they can come to terms with will will pay you a per finished hour rate which is kind of the standard. Um, or they can say, we don't have any money to pay you up front, but we'll give you a percentage of, of sales. Um, I don't do the royalty share stuff, uh, but, uh, but there's, there's no reason to, to believe that that couldn't potentially be far more lucrative than, than the per finished hour guarantee that I, that I always ask for instead. <laughs> Well, it's better to have money that you know you can pay the bills with than the money you could potentially pay the bills with. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Is I I I, I need to know for sure that I'm getting paid. <laughs> you know that that makes a lot of sense. And I know with audiobooks, you know, it depends on who you are as well and what you can push. And you know, there's people who do the who do it that aren't you know SAG Af uh, Afra. You know, they aren't union members, and so they, they do yeah. what they can. And but you've done a lot of work. And uh, so, so question: When you record, say a twenty and, you know, some of these books are like 20 hours. How long do they give you to record it? Do they say, you know, give this back in a week? Uh, most of the stuff that I work on, I do through publishers. I, I don't I don't usually work on ACX anymore. I, I did for a little bit. Um, but I usually work through, through bigger publishers. Uh, the biggest one that I work with is Tantor Audio. Um, and those publishers do tend to have slightly tighter deadlines than, than what you'll see typically on an ACX project. The ACX stuff, I remember, they'd be like, you have two months to finish this eight-hour book. And that's way more time than you'd ever need. Um, but uh, but Tantor stuff, I, I'm typically given a window that's... Uh, it, it varies depending on how long the book is a little bit, but it's usually two, three weeks total. Uh, if it's a shorter book, maybe it's only 10 days or something. Um, but that's that's start to finish usually. I don't usually get the materials earlier than that window, so I have to start preparing as soon as as soon as I as soon as I get them, which is at the start of that little ten day window or however long it is, and and sometimes that can be tricky. <laughs> yeah. And um, so you said how sometimes they'll send you like a word back that's not done. Is that why some audiobooks you'll have like someone talking, and all of a sudden you have like like a random word just like in there that sounds slightly different and then they continue talking normal because they missed a word maybe um it's it's obviously better if you can keep the sound consistent um the 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 procedure that tantor has is they'll they'll they have somebody go go through and do proofing for me um which is another thing that's different when you're working on acx with those self-published authors and stuff, you're you're kind of you're a one-man shop. You have to do all of the proofing and all of the editing and all the corrections yourself. Um, but uh, but Tantor has a quality control step where I I record everything and I send it off. Somebody listens to it all and watches the text and they go, okay, that that word's wrong right there or whatever. You know, they check for consistency. They check for mistakes. They check for any noise that maybe got into the recording that shouldn't have, um, et cetera, so forth. And then they'll send me a list of corrections that I need to make as, long, as well as a little MP3 file that is just like, here's your voice match reel. These are the sections that we need you to re-record as they are cur currently recorded. Um, and that'll give you an idea of what you sounded like when you did it the first time, so just try and match that as best you can, which I I, I think helps. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that that would definitely help because sometimes if they say we just need this word, you know, sound changes a, a lot. Well, you 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 can't just record just one word because that we as humans we we run words together and 
that that doesn't work. But so you have to you have to fix the whole sentence. And I'll usually I'll usually go a step further when I'm recording my pickups. I will say, okay, they need me to fix this sentence. I'll record the sentence before that through the sentence after that, and they can find a spot in there. The editor can find a spot in there to cut in and out that makes it sound more consistent. Okay. Um, this one last uh, listener question, since um, this is the other part that voiceover people usually do, because if you get in a cert if you get an ad campaign, you're going to make more money than you usually would with with most projects. <laughs> you've done um, some advertising, but not a lot. Is that something you bit. started with early, or is it something you're you're trying to get more into now? Uh, it's it's I think I think commercials are, are have to be a part of every every voice actor's portfolio. Um, and I don't book as many of them as I would like to. Um, part of that is because I'm I am a union member, and I and more and more of the commercial world is going non-union, and the non-union rates are just abysmal in comparison to to what you can make on a union campaign. Uh, um, but uh, but it's they're they're still they're they're pretty big. If you if you book a big national campaign, like I did a. I did a Taco Bell uh, campaign for the Super Bowl a couple years back. Nice. That that was quite lucrative. I, I made uh, I made more than I make on probably the average four or five audiobooks from that one campaign where I recorded six words. So <laughs> <laughs> they're they're uh, they're a pretty great gig when you can get them <laughs> and they pay you per time the ad is played right yeah uh it's yeah it's it's there's a there's a cap on how much you can get paid for airing on on cable um but if it airs on network like on nbc cbs fox abc it or the cw that those just keep paying every time it airs you get another small chunk of change and that that is a lot of money do they pay you more for having it in the Super Bowl, other than the no. million they already paid for the ad? No, they don't. In in fact, uh, I remember going in for the session. I was like, you know, I was excited about the fact that this is a Super Bowl campa campaign. But what if they blew the whole budget on that one airing, and all I'm going to get is the check for the one time that it goes on the air? So I was asking everybody I knew. I was like, keep watching TV. Tell me if you see it somewhere after the Super Bowl, <laughs> and. And it did. It did end up airing uh, mostly on like ESPN and stuff, which is great because it's one of the biggest biggest cable networks there is. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, I maxed out on my cable earnings pretty quickly on that one. I see. Well, this has been fantastic. Um, you mentioned how you've done uh, appearances and you've done uh, panels and so on. Do you have any upcoming um, appearances or panels or? I guess a lot of voice actors teach as well. Any anything like that for the fans to uh, hunt you down? Find the you? the only convention appearance I have in the books for the coming year is MatsuriCon in Columbus, Ohio. I'm going back for the second year in a row, and it's August 24th through 26th, so it's a it's a ways out. Uh, and this is the year 2018. If you're listening to this later on in life. <laughs> um, uh, but that's that's the only thing that I have in in the books at the moment. If you are interested in having me or, or any anybody make a guest appearance at a convention, uh, I highly recommend you contact the convention itself. Don't just tweet at me and say, "Hey, I want you to come to this con." That that's not how I get there. I, I get there by because because I can I can contact the convention and say, "Hey, I would like to come." But that doesn't hold any anywhere near as much weight as when fans who are who are planning on going to the convention contact the the convention and say, "Hey, I would like to meet this person at the con," because that lets them know that that we're desirable, that that you want us there. And I know, uh, you know, I've I've gone to the Salt Lake Comic Con a lot recently because that's where I, I've lived for the past nine years. And you know, they uh -huh. once they like they didn't bring voice actors in to start with, but once they brought in. Uh, about an Animaniacs guys, and they did their, oh, all, yeah. their live panels where they like rip off things. And since yeah. then, they brought in. I think last one they brought in Sabbath. They brought in uh, Jennifer Hitler. They brought in tons of voice actors because they were the most popular people there. And I was like, yeah, yeah. They, they, people love to see you guys, especially now that we're in the age where we can actually find out who does this voice. Oh, it's this person right here. It's talk to them because before we couldn't really 
do that. It, yeah, it yeah. Really helped. The internet has has opened opened the gates. <laughs> and that's how we can find people like you, because uh, before then you'd you'd be a name that would go really quickly on TV, and it's like, oh, can you see it? No, nope, no, nope, name's gone. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, and you can also, obviously, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on, uh, on my Twitch channel. Uh, and I'm, I'm just Kyle McCarley in those places. Um, I do Twitch streams fairly regularly. It's been a little bit and I, I did a lot of travel through the month of November, but, uh, but now I've, now I've got some time and I'm, and I'm getting back to it. What are you finishing up now? Finishing up my playthrough of Fire Emblem Echoes right now. Nice. Um, and then, uh, and then I might go back to the original Nier once I'm done with that, because I only did the first route of that one. So Nier would, yeah, original Nier would be very interesting, or even earlier if you have a ability to play a PlayStation 2 game, so the Dragon, the original Dragon Guard, because that'll be a really, um, it's very different than Nier. Yeah. Do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, people can also go to your website, which is kylemccarley.com, right? Correct. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, is there anything else you'd like uh, the fans to know or to be looking out for or anything like that to support you? Um, well, I can. there is one one up, upcoming release that I can talk about that's the, the cast has been announced and everything, so I can, I can push this out there. Uh, there's a show coming to Netflix in, oh, I think we even have a release date now, if I'm not mistaken. I need to do a search. Uh, the show is called Be the Beginning. It's coming to Netflix in, I want to say, March? I can't remember. I can't remember if we have an official release date. But it's it's you can go ahead and add it to your queue on Netflix now. Um, and I, I play the voice of, uh, of Koku. And Ray Chase is, is the voice of Keith. Um, uh, Fay Mata, um, I think Ben Diskin and Brianna Knickerbocker. Anyway, it's, it's a really cool show that I am so excited to see and I'm excited to, to get the, the fan reaction from. Um, keep an eye out for that one. It's coming, coming this spring. I think it's in March. I can't remember. I think we got a release date, but I, I just cannot remember for sure. I know it's spring of 2018. Um, and you can go ahead and add it to your Netflix queue now so that you're notified when, when the episodes come out. Be the beginning. Um, my anime list says it's on March 2nd. So there you have, go. They have a date here. Whether or not that's an official one, but it's there. Um, that, that sounds right to me. <laughs> it, it looks pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I remember seeing this trailer pop up in the, in the Netflix stuff. So uh, there's, yeah. there's very little about it out there so far, but it's really cool. It's really cool. <laughs> well, you guys heard it here. Go check out Be the Beginning, March 2nd, 2018, when it comes up on Netflix. Um, 12 episodes. So it looks like it's going to be a much better than what happened when we got Castlevania and we got the little tease of four episodes. Yeah, four episodes, yeah. <laughs> Such a tease. Such a tease. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for being on. This was this was fantastic. I love I love talking to, to every voice actor. It's, it's one of my favorite things to do on the show and why I, I do podcasts because it's I love it. I absolutely love it. Well, thank you so much for having me. And now that I have time, I think I might bust out Nier and actually be able to play it more. Nier, you're Nier, not the original Nier. It's really good. It's really good. I know I'm biased, but it's really good. I, I've heard so much, even from my, my friends. I know there's a listener, Matt, who's going to be uh, talk, say, calling me as soon as he hears this, saying, go play it. And I know he just played it. I think he got... He was, uh, I know he was playing it, but uh, yeah, uh, I have time now. I have time. I can yeah, go out yeah. and not feel guilty that I'm going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for being on and giving us so much of your time. And I wish you the best and hope uh, we get to see a lot more of you in the future. And with anime, we'll probably see hundreds of projects. <laughs> well, thank you so much.